So the, uh, what I want to do today is to uh, tell you about some example of uh, application of the uh, methods and, I, and idea that I uh, uh, discussed with you, so cuts rice and dynamical mean field theory, uh, in some cases in which you have indeed high dimensional landscape, you want to study gradient flow or gradient descent, and you have a signal to recover, and well, you have a lot of bad minima, and well, you want to know what's going to happen. So, well, this is, I mean, some cases, and I don't think it's, we can say that we have a general understanding of the dynamics in this high dimension non convex landscape, but we have idea in some directions, and this, I think, is, well, the direction in which we are going, and I will tell you at the end also my, the connection, or, I mean, the difference and similarities with dynamics in deep nets, which I think we understand even less. Um, all right, so the model that I will discuss at the beginning, so I want to tell you about problems in which you have a lot of bad minima and you have barriers, and then I will discuss uh, quickly entropic barriers. This was something that somebody asked me, uh, I think, uh, in the, uh, the second lecture. Um, so but we start first with a, a problem in which you have a rough landscape. So the problem that I'm going to study is something that, I mean, to tell you, is something that we did together with uh, Link and Florent and others. So it's a kind of, you see, it's an energy, so it's a kind of energy that we discussed already. Is this is a problem in which you have the tensor and the matrix to recover, so you have both information. So you have this. This is what I call V, is the vector which is corrupted by noise. So this matrix contains one part which is deterministic and one part which is noise. Then you have a tensor with the uh, signal plus the noise, and from this you construct the uh, an energy function which contains both terms with two parameters, delta 2 and delta p, which are, uh, let's say, uh, the strength of, uh, you can think of the signal, are related to the signal to noise ratio. And it's the tip, well, it's the form exactly that we uh, consider already. Uh, when we consider this term, it was lecture number two, was just the uh, matrix PCA, and then we, I discussed this in which was just tensor PCA, and now we take uh, the, two, uh, the two together. Okay, all right. And so, well, this is the problem. The problem is, so I have this energy. In this energy, there is when you, I think I have it. Uh, well, in this energy, there will be a part which is random and then a part which is deterministic. We start from random initial condition. We do gradient flow. And we want to know whether or not, depending on the signal to noise ratio, on the strength of delta 2 and delta p, whether we find the signal or not. And uh, the idea is exactly, I mean, the, what we are going to do is, well, first thing we, well, we, we have on our hand, we have dynamic mean field theory, so we can study the dynamics. We have the cut strikes method, so we can apply the cut strikes method to see what happens to the uh, structure of critical points. And we want to figure out what the dynamics is going to do. And then try to see whether we can, from this, we can get some general understanding that maybe is valid also more generally, not just for this model, but more generally. All right, so if you do dynamic mean field theory, so if you, get an, uh, you consider an equation like this, so you see this is a gradient flow. This is the, uh, uh, this is the uh, multi Lagrange multiplier that forces the spherical constraint. And actually, in a different series of paper, we study gradient flow, but also Langevin dynamics. So today, I will just study gradient flow, so there will be no noise here. But given this equation, you can apply the machinery of dynamic I mean, field theory that I, tell you, I told you about yesterday. And as, uh, as I told you yesterday, in some cases, uh, the equation simplify. You don't have this self-consistent stochastic process, but can you write that? You can write down coupled integral differential equation that maybe look not very nice, but they are actually nicer than uh, the uh, self-consistent stochastic process that I described. So here, inside here, you have this function, which are c of t t prime that I will discuss, which is one over n, sum over i of x i of t, x i of t prime, which I think I discussed yesterday. So this you have to really to think this will tell you how much the system has decorrelated between the position that he has at time t and the position that he has at time t prime. So it really tells you how much the system is moving. And then you have, well, the response function, which is, uh, is related to sum over i of x i t and then h i of t prime. So here, also in this case, you can put the field, h equal to 0. And then what we call c bar here is what I call m yesterday. I'm sorry. I mean, it's the notation are not the same, but it's the same thing. So this will tell us whether the system recover uh, the signal or not. 
And uh, so you can study this equation. You can both study actually analytically in part, and then you can integrate them numerically. Uh, this was what Stefano Sarao did in a very, in a very efficient way. And so, well, what, 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 what do you find if you, on one hand, you integrate the equation, and on the other hand, you, uh, you do the cuts rights computation? So this is the phase diagram that you get. Um, so this is delta p and this is 1 over delta 2 are the two parameters. So let's say that I move, uh, I move this way. So, I so what are the different colors? So what different colors means in this case are, so there is a part of the phase diagram in which it actually is known to be impossible to retrieve the signal. So from the point of view of the landscape, uh, you can think that in this case, the landscape is like uh, we already discussed, it's so rough, the uh, random part is so strong that there is no minimum actually associated to, to the signal. Here, well, it's, it can be shown that it's impossible to re recover the signal. There is a part in which the signal is in principle there, but it's very hard, so there are no uh, uh, algorithms that are uh, able to find it in, uh, in, in, in a time which is polynomial in N. What's the uh, axis? Sorry? What's the axis? Okay, so the axis are, so here you see the model that I define it with this parameter in front. So one is the weight of the matrix part, and the other is the weight of the tensor part. And so this is a region in which is hard for all algorithms. And then there is instead the region which is easy in the sense that, well, we know we, there are algorithms that are known, like uh, AMP, which can recover the signal. But gradient flow actually is able actually to recover the signal only below this line, okay? So only, only in, uh, uh, sorry, only above this line. So in this region here. <coughs> and in this region here, there are algorithms that are able to do it, but gradient flow is not able to do it, okay? So, okay, of course, gradient flow is not the best algorithm uh, given a specific problem. If you have a specific problem, you should think what is the best algorithm. In general, it's not gradient flow, it's not gradient descent. But the good thing of gradient flow, gradient descent, which is, well, you, you use it in many, many different cases in which you have a problem which is very different, difficult and complex, and then you use this kind of algorithm. So it's interesting to know what, 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 what it does. And now the interesting thing is, so from the dynamics, you know where gradient flow, what is the algorithmic transition of gradient flow, and it's this line here. Now you can compute, for example, if you go this way, you can compute the, uh, uh, the uh, do the cuts rise computation. And so in the cuts rise computation, it's a little bit, so in this case, it's the case that uh, we consider, I think if we do the, uh, uh, this, these images in which I had a red, so you have a red region here. If you go like this, so if you are in this regime here, um, so you would be in a regime in which you have a lot of critical points here, and then you have, so it was yellow, I think, and then you have actually a ground state which is uh, uh, in the direction of the signal, which is around here, okay? So this is what happens in this region. So in this, in this sorry, in this region here. Uh, and then, so, and also in this region here, actually, when you are here, you still have a lot of critical points here, a lot of bad minima. So what actually the method, the Katz-Rice method is telling you is that in all this region, the system is able to, gradient flow is able, we're starting from a random initial condition, is able to find the, uh, the signal, but there is an exponential number of minima and saddles. So the landscape is very rough, but the system is able to find the signal. And then there is another line, where this is the trivialization transition that we discuss. Above this line, the landscape is very simple then it's not a big surprise, actually, that uh, uh, gradient, uh, gradient flow is able to recover the signal. So the surprise, really, is that these two lines, I mean, are different, and here gradient flow is able to recover the signal, even though there is an exponential number of bad minima. And this is what I want to discuss, so how, it, how is it possible, what's the mechanism behind this? Uh, something that maybe I should say also is that, as you remember, uh, whoop. So mean field theory is done in the limit n going to infinity first and t finite, which means actually that 
Uh, there is something which is slightly legal that we are doing, uh, but that we think is not so illegal. So is that the, uh, the initial con when you take the initial condition, in principle, the initial condition has an overlap which is of order one of the square root of n with the signal. So if you take n going to infinity first, it's going to be zero. Uh, so instead, what we are going to study when, when we say that gradient flow succeed is that we put a, a, an overlap at the beginning, which is epsilon, and then we, we let epsilon go into zero. And we hope that actually, well, it's this, we can understand what happens with, uh, when we take one over square root of epsilon, so one over square root of n, uh, sorry. We hope that we can understand what happens when we take the initial condition at random, which has an overlap one over square root of n, just looking at what happens when epsilon is going to zero. And I mean, we think that there is no problem, at least in this case. Okay, but this is just to telling, to telling you that, I mean, it's, we cannot work with overlap, which is a one square root of n, if you use dynamic and mean field theory. Okay. Um, all right, so what's, what's, what's happening? What's happening here? So now what I want to uh, just draw for you is if you uh, run a dynamic and mean field theory and you go this way, what do, you, what do you find? So in this region here, in which in principle is easy but gravity and flow fails, the system is not able to recover the signal. And what happens here is that the system has what in physics we call aging dynamics, so the system remains always out of equilibrium. And, uh, and we will never find the solution. And so, so what you find in this case is that if you plot the loss or the energy as a function of time, what you find is that, well, the loss goes down to a certain value, you know that there is the ground state, which is here, but the system never goes to it, always remains here. It, it is not able to recover the signal. And uh, so the other interesting function that you can plot is the co correlation function, C of t, t prime, as a function of t minus t prime for different value of t prime. And this has this characteristic behavior, which is uh, it's like this. So this is increasing t prime, and I'm taking t larger than t prime. So what this means, so we can think about what this really means. So ct t prime is telling me how much the system is discorrelating. So let's say that t prime is less than t. So what I'm doing is I'm a certain time t prime, and I want to see how the system decorrelates from the configuration that it has at time t prime when I increase t. This is t minus t prime. So what you see here is that the, the more the system actually goes down in energy or in loss, the more it takes actually to the system to co it decorrelate from itself. So which means that the system is becoming, has a dynamics that is becoming slower and slower. And so, I mean, the longer is the time, the slower is the evolution because it takes longer and longer. It's really like if there was a relaxation time scale, but the relaxation time scale depends on the age, age of the system or how much uh, time has, uh, has gone through. So this is why this actually this behavior is called aging in physics. And all this is really related to the fact that the system remains out of equilibrium. So in the landscape, again, you have to think that in this regime there is a ground state, but the system is just blocked in bed minima, or actually is flowing uh, just on top of bed minima. And now to understand now what the system is doing, what you can do is that you can compute dynamically, you can study what is the Hessian, the, what, what are the eigenvalue of the Hessian of the system when the system is at a very long time here. And what you find is that the system is very close actually to critical points uh, which have an Hessian which is a semicircle like this, which is marginally stable. This is, let's say, the Hessian, the distribution of the eigenvalue of the Hessian uh, for t going to infinity. So when you, and when you do, so what you have to think now is that the system is, actually you start the system on, on the equator, it remains on the equator, and if you study the distribution of uh, critical points on the equator, what you find is exactly what, if you remember what I discussed when uh, I discussed cuts rise. So you have this kind of distribution in energy in which you have, let's say, one minimum, which is the good minimum, and then you have many others. And then at a certain point, you have this energy, which is called threshold. I mean, this is a simplification, but uh, let's go for it. And then you hope 
you have many directions which go down. And the system, what it does, it goes from high energy, because when it starts, it has a very high energy, then it goes down, and then actually remains, I mean, it remains very, I mean, it, it approaches very slowly, these, these critical points, and it's not actually able to go down and find this one. So these are the ones that really trap the dynamics, this dynamic out of equilibrium. And you can, naively, you could, uh, you can try, I mean, it's, this is not something that, you could have guessed maybe a priori. So you really need to solve the uh, dynamic admin field equation. So it has been found in many different uh, models. And a posteriori, you could say maybe it's natural in the sense that these are, let's say, the most numerous states and have a, a basing, which is I mean, at, least, at least locally, which is very large. So this is an a posteriori justification. But in practice, what you sh I mean, to justify this, you should know what are the basing of attraction of all these different minima. And this is really a dynamical quantity, so you cannot really get it in with, with just uh, cuts rise. Okay, so this for this you have to solve the dynamics, and solving the dynamics you realize that the system goes there. Yeah? No, I think you exactly said that, because I was wondering what happens like in the cuts rise counting at the blue line, but at the blue line, I will tell you. So this is so there is a question indeed whether we can understand actually this uh, gradient uh, flow transition in terms of the landscape, and the answer is yes in this case. Uh, but uh, okay, so is this clear what the dynamics is doing when it's not able to recover the signal? Base yes. No, well, no, because here I'm studying gradient flow, so there is no temperature, so there, there is no, there are no activated processes. Uh, we could put the, uh, well, we, we study what happens with temperature and you have something which is generalized this. And in that case, you can have activated processes, but they take times which are so large that you cannot just forget about them. Okay, so now the question is indeed, so the system here is out of equilibrium, uh, in, I mean, as a physicist would say, and here it succeeds, and can we understand what, what is this line, what the system is doing? So... Okay, so what trapped the dynamics? This is just, I'm just rephrasing what I just uh, told you on, on the left. Uh, so what trapped the dynamics? So here is the, the behavior of the energy. So you see that, well, it goes to a certain value that actually we can, we can obtain uh, analytically. And uh, what you find here is that, uh, well, this is, again, is changing, approaching the transition. So here, you, the system doesn't find the signal, doesn't find the signal. And here, what you see is that, it goes until a certain time, and then, well, on this, uh, here it just uh, has a transition which is very fast to, uh, to the ground state. And, uh, and this is, well, was just to show you indeed the action that you find when you approach the, uh, at very long time, before, I mean, in, in this regime when the system doesn't find the signal. So, how is it? What, what is this transition? Now, what you have to think is that now, if you, when you approach the transition, so the system is really attracted by these states, the states which are here. And so, if you want to understand what happens to why the dynamics is there, uh, you should study what happens to these states when you approach this, this blue line, as was, was discussed. So what happens is that you can study the, uh, uh, the action again, and the action of those states is a GOE matrix, actually it's shifted GOE matrix that gives you exactly, well, the action that I described here. But actually, there is an ad additional term, which is this rank one perturbation. And so you see that if this rank one, one perturbation is strong enough, actually the action will not be just some, I mean, the semicircle, but will be a semicircle plus an eigenvalue which pops out. And what this is telling you is that what happening is that these states which are here, when you approach the blue line, uh, well, when they cross the blue line, they have a direction which goes down and goes down, so they become unstable, I have a direction which goes down toward the signal. So I hope now if I put all the pieces together, so what we find is that all these states have an action. So these states, as I told you, uh, I think uh, yesterday, so these states are more stable. So they have an action which is a semicircle, but with all the eigenvalues which are positive. And they will have actually one eigenvalue which pops out with the direction toward the signal. But since they are positive, okay, they pops out, but it remains positive. The ones that are here, the ones that trap the dynamics, actually, well, they are marginally stable, and as soon, actually, the eigenvalue pops out, they have a direction which is negative, and which go toward the signal. So what you 
should think so is that really the system is going down the, uh, the, uh, and it's going down toward the uh, critical point that have the largest basin of attraction, which are the ones on top. And then those ones uh, have a direction that appear, which goes toward the signal. And so this, their instability that is controlling where the uh, gradient flow has an algorithm in transition. And then uh, there are still, uh, so in this, in this regime, gradient flow is able to recover the signal because it goes down and then it goes toward the signal. Even though there are very deep minima, very bad minima, but they are never actually visited by, uh, by the dynamics. Yes? From a random initiative. Yes, definitely, yes. Which is, uh, so you, you, you help the system to be a little bit in the direction of, of yes, the signal? Yes, initialization. Then I will in one of these. I don't think so. I don't think, uh, no, you really have to, uh, to have, so, well, it's, I mean, one way to do it is to uh, play and take a Gibbs measure, for example, but uh, okay. no, otherwise it's difficult to find them. So the thing is really that they are there, but I mean, since their basic of attraction with respect to random initial condition is so small, it's, you, you cannot get them except if you have some, let's say, a priori knowledge of where they are. So they are really difficult to find. And so, and then you see that the, uh, the trivialization of the landscape will arrive actually much later, is actually when all these states, all these ones, will have an eigenvalue which becomes negative. So these ones will be the last one to disappear. And only at this point, the landscape will become, sta will become completely, uh, completely easy without any, any bad minima. So uh, this is, I think, it's uh, just to show you also what you can get with the uh, dynamic and mean field equation. So you can track the uh, the Hessian, really the distribution of eigenvalues, and uh, during during the dynamics. So what you have is that you start the dynamics, you go down, then you approach these uh, critical uh, critical points, and then so this is a case is just slightly uh, uh, beyond the dynamical transition. So this eigenvalue is actually is negative, slightly negative. This is the value of the magnetization. And so it's slightly negative, so the system will grow in this direction. And then, well, at a certain point, a certain time scale, it will really start to go down. And actually, when it starts to go down, this direction will increase. And then will, uh, becomes, uh, will becomes more negative, and then at the end, will become positive. OK, so this is, I think is, OK, I will stop it. So it's just to show you again that with these techniques, at least in this simple case, I mean, all the questions that you find, for example, in deep nets, what the action is doing, what the dynamics is doing when, when you start to really go down toward the signal, all these kind of things, we can, we can really study them, uh, putting together all the techniques that I discuss with you. So this is just the, uh, a summary of, uh, uh, of what we just discussed. Uh, so you have... So, gradient, so here there is a regime in which you increase the signal to noise ratio, there is a minimum, but you are not able to find it. And then at a certain point, you will be able to find it with gradient flow, just because the uh, uh, minima with, that have the largest basing of attraction on which the dynamics is trapped, if you are here, they become unstable, and though you, so you will, find, you, you will find them. And only much later, you find the trivialization of the landscape. So this is something, again, that I would like to stress. If you, it's really something that happens because you, take a, you are in a large dimension. So if you are, have a system which is in finite dimension, if it has a certain number of minima and you take a random initial condition, well, with a certain probability, you will, uh, you will fall in the bad minima. With some probability, maybe you will fall in the good minima. Here, because of the very large dimension, even though there is an exponential number of bad minima, you can actually find, find, find a good one with probability one. Because in this regime here, you find the good one with probability one, even though there are many which are very bad. OK? Are there questions? OK, so this is what we found in uh, this uh, matrix uh, and, uh, and tensor PCA. So you, uh, of course, I mean, the natural question is how general this is. And uh, so we continue to, to study this problem, and I will not tell you more, but there is a poster on, on uh, phase retrieval. So we work uh, already on phase retrieval with Lenka, Florent, Stefano, and, and, and others, the same of, the, of, the same of this paper. 
And uh, well, we have some indication that something similar maybe is going on, but we, I don't think we understand completely the problem. So really, I mean, the direction uh, for us is to, uh, well, to try to understand how much, I mean, this picture, which I think is re very reasonable, how much can be pushed to uh, other problems uh, in the estimation and try to go toward problems like, uh, for example, generalized linear models, uh, and then, well, e even, even further. Okay, so I think you, you can, for, for example, go and see the poster of Tony Bonner. I think it's, I, I, di I didn't ask, I don't know what Francesca has as a poster, but maybe she is also discussing problem in which you have, again, dynamic and field theory and uh, dynamics in high dimension. No, not much on physics. Okay, not much on physics. Okay, all right, but you can ask her because she also works on this. Yeah. So in the GF transition, you can, uh, you can, can you figure that out? By looking at like the index of the by a like Yeah. I mean it's you, you can so what we maybe what I should say is that so this line here, uh, so again this was maybe something that you could think so when you have dynamic mean filter, you have this numerical equation, and so what do you do with this numerical equation? So you integrate them. So maybe you could say, okay, you could maybe do a simulation. It's the same thing. But actually, this line is analytical. So, so this is, we extract from those equations the point at which the, uh, uh, the, uh, the system will start to find the signal uh, from the, the MFT. And then we can also do the cuts rise and find that when, when, is the, uh, when, the, when the threshold state have a direction which go toward the signal, again, if I do the computation, it's exactly the same. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, what do you mean? How, how, well, it decreases it typically. So when you, when you go in this direction, it decreases. But it decreases uh, how fast? And I, 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 I there don't. Is no of this, there is no computation that is. Uh, there is a, can I find it? Uh, I, I, uh, no, I, I, I don't remember. I mean, he, Stefano did the computation of the cut strikes, but I'm not sure he computed also at fixed latitude. Uh, he, he certainly computed uh, here on the equator. I don't remember he computed fixed latitude. In principle, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a difficult generalization. And what you expect, indeed, is that we'll go down. And then at a certain point, it will disappear if you're close enough to the signal. In this case, yeah, at least. Yes. So how, how do you get uh, from the DMFT the, the line you perturbation around the uh, Yeah, so, so you, what you do is that you, you say that you, you, um, you put the very, you, you see actually when actually the solution in a certain sense, here I have a solution which is the out of equilibrium solution and uh, you, you want to understand when this is unstable dynamically. So you can think if you put a slightly value, a small value of M and you see when this will grow to infinity. And uh, it's, yes, it's a kind of stability of the dynamical solution which is out of equilibrium, which correspond to the out of equilibrium. Other questions? OK, so if there are no other questions, actually, now I will switch to the other thing I wanted to discuss, which are this entropic barrier that was, uh, they were asked. So maybe now I close it, and I thank you. All right, so to discuss the entropic barrier, I, again, I want to discuss a very simple case. Uh, and then, well, you can generalize to more complicated case. But the, so the simple case that I want to discuss is, uh, again, since I want to, I will use the same uh, kind of model that I discussed until now, which is tensor PCA. So tensor PCA, is, which is, uh, if I take the Hamiltonian, as I wrote, is E of S. So now it's S, is not X. 
minus sum over i1 ip, j i1 ip, s i1 s i p, and then you have minus r n divided by p, sum over i s i d i to the p, and then, well, you remember sum over i s i square is equal to n, and sum over i v i square is equal to n, and this is the signal that you want to decover, and here you have a disorder part, and here you have the signal. Okay. So, well, if you study this problem, so here for the moment there is no, entro no entropic barrier. Here the landscape is comp very complicated. It's uh, similar actually to, uh, well, where we discussed already the landscape here. So if you do cuts rise, the cuts rise method, you realize that there are again a lot of bad minima here. Uh, if R is large enough, there will be actually one ground state. But if you consider gradient flow, Actually, gradient flow will succeed, and this is actually is proven now, only when r is, let's say, much larger than n uh, to the power p minus 2 divided by 2. And actually, one way to think, uh, to try to understand why, how, how you get this is, uh, um, I think it's in a paper by uh, Andrea, well, the one I cited, in which they compute the annealed uh, um, the annealed complexity is that when R is much larger than this, what happens is that this, uh, uh, so the bed minima here are on, uh, on a width which becomes much less than one of square root of n. So this means that when you take a configuration at random, it, the configuration will be actually out of this band, and so it will uh, reach, the, uh, reach the minimum. So this is, uh, so in a certain sense, when R is much larger than this, you still have, um, maybe Bay has still have bad minima, but they are really, really in a region in which it's not the initial condition, and so you, and you go. So this is an interpretation, but this is what you get. Okay, so. Exactly. So P equal to 2 is the example in which there were just two n critical points, so there was nothing, nothing interesting, I mean, nothing complicated was happening. So now, the, what I wanted to do, it's really a toy model. Uh, but again, well, we don't have much time, so I would, and I want to discuss just the phenomenon, is imagine that I do online, uh, some online or SGD dynamics, and I will do it in a very simple way. So what I'm going to say is that, well, instead of having a landscape like this, at each time t, I get a new, uh, a new j. So I have an energy now, so the gradient, if I compute the gradient, gradient of e of e, there will be a time, uh, a time t of s i time t. So this will get this part, which now contains a t. So at each time, I get a new tensor. Is it OK? And uh, so I will get one part of it, which will be minus sum over i1, i2 ip. So this is the gradient. So it's, let's say, it's d e e s i. So it will be uh, J I I2 IP plus, well, these are all the combinations. So it's I2 I I3 IP and so on. And then I have S I2 S IP. And then I have, well, this term, which is must minus R sum over I S I V I P minus 1 V I. So this part, and sorry, and here there is a T. So this part here, now you can consider it, which is just a noise in a sense. So you get it something different at each time, whether this part here is deterministic. OK. Is the uh, framework clear? So instead of having a fixed landscape, now I have a j which is different at each time. And then you can wonder, you know, there are all these discussions whether, which are a bit vague, uh, uh, about whether SGD actually is changing the landscape so you can go through barriers, etc. We will see in this case that it's not the case. Uh, but I mean, my point here is I want to show you this uh, entropic, uh, entropic effect. So, so what we are going to do is now is we are going to do a gradient, uh, well, in principle is gradient descent, but it is going to become gradient flow very soon minus SIT equal to eta, so gradient of uh, E of T. And then this has to be on the sphere, so we'll add a spherical multi, uh, well, 
on the sphere. And so the thing I wanted to compute now, it's uh, just I want to compute this noise. I will call it uh, psi i of t. And I want to compute its covariance. What is this noise, psi i of t? So psi i of t. So the average of psi of t is 0, because well, uh, j, remember, j has mean 0. And then I can compute the um, covariance, j i of t, psi i of t, psi i of t t prime. So if you are two different times, wh what is this? Is it 0? What do you think? So at each time, you get a new tensor, which is independent from uh, the tensor that you had before. These are independent Gaussian variables. So clearly, if t is different from t, pi, t prime, the noise is 0. So you must have uh, t equal to t prime to get something which is different from 0. And then, well, if you do now have to do this computation, so in this case, well, you take, you have sum over i2 ip of j. So these indices should be the same. Otherwise, you don't get anything. ip square. You have it p times. And then you have si2 t, si2 t, because you have, well, when you take the square, you have all these terms twice, si p t. And then you take the average. And so, well, the average of j is p sum over i2 ip. This one is 1 over 2 np minus 1. is always the same that we consider until now. And then we have si2 t square, sip square. And then, well, I can do the sum. So I get p divided by 2 sum over i si square t divided by n to the power p minus 1. But since it's on the sphere, this gives me 1, so I get p divided by 2. Okay. So I mean, it's, uh, it's the p, we, I really don't care. It's the only thing I want to say is that this noise is, well, it's a noise with the, uh, uh, which is independent. If t is different from t prime, as if it's you are at the same time, has well, a covariance, which is of order 1. OK, so now what I'm going to do, so now what, what this means is that in this gradient, so you have these two terms. And uh, uh, and, and so what, what I'm going to do, I'm going instead, I, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, um, to consider the discrete uh, evolution, I'm going to say to consider a continuous evolution. This is just for simplicity, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, there is no problem in considering the discrete uh, evolution. But instead of studying this, I'm going to study DSIDT, which is the a kind of continuum approximation of this equation. Of, so it will be gradient, so the, this part, which is the deterministic part of the gradient, which is minus R sum over i s i di divided by n to the p minus 1 di. And then I have plus ci of t. And then uh, minus lambda s i of t. And then I take a noise, ci of t. Maybe I should call it ci bar. It's not the same. Uh, such that its average is equal to 0. And ci prime, it's equal to 2t delta t minus t prime. And now t, in principle, I mean, if I try to do really an approximation of what I have here, t will be, um, I think it was p divided by 2 times the learning rate. And I also changed the time here. It's not the time that I had at the beginning, but I rescaled time by t times eta. And this is just an approximation. But again, I'm I mean, it's not for the problem, for the things I want to discuss, I could go on with this, it will be just a bit cumbersome, so I will not do it. And I will discuss the phenomenon here in the continuum limit. And uh, this will be just an approximator, an approximated way to study this, and you can do it uh, in the discrete case if you want. Is it clear? So for me, in the following, I don't care about the p and the eta, so it's just that the t is of order 1, the temper what we would call the temperature is of order 1, and I want to study this equation. Again, everything is very simple. It's just to show you the phenomenon. 
and then I will give you some reference in which they do much more than what I'm doing here. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to see if the system is able to recover the signal. And uh, so in principle, you could think that for sure it's going to recover the signal, right? So you have, here you have a landscape. In this landscape, there is just the deterministic part. And the deterministic part is, well, is telling you, uh, well, that you should go in the direction of the signal, right? I mean, it's the, uh, so there is a sign which is wrong. This was a plus, right? Do you agree? It's minus because this is, and also, wow. It's minus here. It's the gradient descent, not gradient ascent. Okay, so here you have something that pushes you in the direction of the signal. So it means that you have in the energy landscape, there are no barriers at all. There is just an energy landscape in which, which goes down when S goes to V. Then you have noise and then the spherical constraint. So if you, are in, if you were in, let's say, low dimension, I mean, if you have uh, a problem in which you have just one minimum, you have noise, well, you will go to the, uh, you will go to the minimum there is without any problem, right? Well, except, I mean, if the noise lets you go everywhere inside the configuration space. Now, what we're going to see is that this is not the case now when n is large. So what I'm going to study now is the uh, over the magnetization, let's say m, which is sum over i of s i v i divided by n. So it's the projection of the configuration s toward the signal. And uh, so let's do it. So I will multiply this equation by vi and then divide by n. Let's do it, so I get uh, uh, sum over i vi dsi dt equal to r m to the p minus 1. Then I have sum over i vi square. Then I have plus sum over i vi ci bar. And then I have minus lambda sum over i vi si of t. And then, well, so uh, what I, if I divide by n, begin here, what I get is an equation for, which is dm dt, because here I have some over i d i s i, equal to r m p minus 1. So this term here is 1, because v has norm 1. Then I have this term, which is minus lambda. Uh, m, and then I have this term, which I will call it plus a of t. Now this term here, a of t, you see it's just a, a random noise. And how does it scale? So what's the scale of this? It's order 1, order n, order 1 or square root of n. Exponential of n. One square root of n, exactly. So, so what we have, what you see is that you, know, you have an equation on m in which you have a very small noise, which is of order one square root of n. And it's of order one square root of n because this is of order, <coughs> well, you just do, uh, I mean, it's, you just use the uh, so central limit theorem argument. Okay, so you have a closed equation. You have a, an equation in which in, on m, in which still you have, we have to fix lambda. So let's fix lambda and uh, so to fix lambda, you have to in, in, uh, uh, impose the spherical constraint. So we just take this equation and we multiply by SI. So we have sum over I, SI, dS, I, dt. And then we have R, M to the P minus 1. Then, when I, then I have sum over SI, VI. And then I have plus sum over i si ci bar, and then I have minus lambda sum over i si square. And then I divide by n, begin here. Okay. All right, so now I still have something to, uh, in order to continue the computation here, I have to to use a small trick. 
So what I want to impose the spherical constraint, I want to impose that sum over i s i square is equal to n. So I want to suppose this one so this square is equal to n, which also means that the derivative with respect to t of sum over i s i square is equal to zero, right? And so I would like to, uh, to say that this term has to be, well, if I can put the s i inside the derivative, this is, I would impose that this is zero. So in this term would go away. This term is m. And well, this, in this way, I, I will fix lambda. Now, I cannot put the si inside the uh, dt because this is a stochastic equation. So I should use the uh, Ito to do the computation well, uh, is the uh, Ito chain rule, which tells you that if you have a function of si and si satisfy the stochastic equation, then the derivative with respect to time of f of si is going to be equal to uh, the, so it's df dSi uh, dSi dt plus t, well, with my notation, will be t times f second of Si. Okay, well, this is, if you know it, is the, uh, is, is the chain rule that you have to use for stochastic equation. Well, if you don't know it, well, we can discuss it later, but I'm not going to prove it now. So in this case, we take, if you take f of Si, which is equal to uh, uh, Si square, uh, maybe si squared divided by 2. Then if I apply this equation, I will get the, uh, the derivative, or no, well, the derivative with respect to, t to time of si squared, it's going to be equal to uh, 2 si dsi dt plus t, and then we have a second derivative, and so it's plus 2 tem times the temperature. OK, do you agree? So the first derivative is, uh, it gives you 2SI, and the second derivative gives you 2. Yes? I can't this, but what is the difference between Xi bar and Xi? Xi bar and Xi. So I have, did I lost? So the Xi that I, Xi I that I defined before? Yeah. So it's just that here, since I, I, I took the, uh, so I did the, the approximation you see in which I changed from the discrete to the continuum. There is a bit of rescaling in Xi, so I call it Xi I bar. But it's related to the other one just uh, by rescaling the time and the rescaling factor in front. Okay. Okay, so let's use this equation now on, on the other side of the board. So we will use it to, uh, to take this and put it on the other side. So I will take, I will put a one half here. And so if we use this equation, what we get, uh, we are going to get, and so now you have to help me, on this side, uh, so I get 1 half sum over i dt of si square minus, uh, it's t, right, minus t, and then there is sum over i divided by n, so it's just t, and here there is an n in front. Okay, do you agree with what I did on this side? Okay, and then I have this term here, which is r m to the p, because this is m. Then here I will have something which I will call b of t. And then here I have minus lambda, and this is spherical constraints, it's equal to 1. So from this, what I get, I get an expression from lambda of t, which is lambda of t is equal to, so I bring this on the other side. So this one is 0, because I have the spherical constraint. constraint. And uh, so I get lambda of t, which is r m to the p minus t, no, plus t, uh, plus t, plus b of t. And now what is b of t? Again, what is the scaling? So this is a noise which is a little bit more complicated because it's uh, uh, associated to s. So, but still, I mean, if you consider what is the scaling of this, it's of order 1 of square root of n. So well, it's much, much smaller than the other. So at the beginning, we, ju we will just drop it, and we consider these two equations uh, without the stochastic part. OK? So let's write what are these equations. Uh, 
so we'll have dm dt. And then I have this one, which is my equal to minus. And then lambda will be t plus rm to the p to the p m plus rm to the p minus 1. And then I have these two, uh, well, plus a of t plus b of t, which are these small noise, which are here. And then this is going to be minus, so let me put everything together. And now we are done, and we can discuss. So if I, did, if I didn't do anything wrong, it should be minus t m minus r 1 minus m square m to the p minus 1 plus this noise here. So this is it correct? So minus tm. I have uh, yeah, it works. I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, if you use the convention, should the B of T always be zero? Because the SI of T shouldn't be correlated with the noise of MC, right? Uh, the B of T. Sorry, w which one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 average will be zero, but it's it's still uh, it's still a random term. All right, so what do we got now? We got an equation which is only m, and we can write this equation like dm dt. Let's uh, do it like in phys a physicist would do. It's minus dv dm. V is the potential, so we'll give you an intuition. And then we have plus noise. So we have a one-dimensional problem in which we have a gradient, uh, gradient descent in a potential V. And what is the form of this potential? V and M. What you get is, OK, we, I can, we'll draw it for you. So the important thing is that since we are considering a case in which P is larger than 2, when M is small, it will always start in m square. So here it always starts in a quadratic way, like t of m square. And then this term, which is favoring the signal, if r is large enough, will actually will make it go down here uh, uh, in such a way that, I mean, the, the true minimum is at m equal 1, exa exactly as you, as you expect. Okay. So this is r is large enough. This you know, so if R is large enough, in principle, you will find uh, uh, the, uh, there is a global minimum which corresponds to finding the signal. But what you see here is that, well, when you start the dynamics, the initial condition for M, so M at zero, it's of order one of the square root of N. So the system is here. And you have noise, but the noise of order one of the square root of N. So the noise is much, much less than the barrier here that you have, this barrier delta. And so which is much, much larger than the noise, which means that the system actually is never going to go there, except if you, are, uh, if you want to wait uh, time scale which diverge exponentially with n. Okay? And now if you, if you see here what is this term, where this term come from, this term come from this which is here, which is the strength actually of the j, remember? So this is the strength of the noise. So it's really come from the fact that when you do this online, uh, online dynamics, at each time step, you, you draw another tensor. And this gives you noise in a deterministic uh, uh, landscape. And since you are in very high dimension, well, what happens is that actually, I mean, the majority of the configuration are on the equator. So it means that if you are, even if the landscape is going down, at each time you get a kick. And this kick will bring you with high probability toward the equator. And so when n is large, at the end, what you get, you get a term here and this is really something that traps you, even though the landscape, in principle, deterministically, should, there, is no, there are no barriers, there is nothing. There is just a landscape that should, at zero temperature should bring you to, uh, uh, to this minimum. But because of the noise, actually, there is an entropic barrier that has been created here. So it's really difficult to escape from the equator just because you have so many configurations and the noise actually can bring you there. Uh, so this which I did in a very poor way, is something that has been studied, uh, well, it's in, in more detail. So, well, of course, uh, online, online dynamics, uh, I think, will be treated at the school by, 
I think, uh, by Sara Solla, but I mean it's uh, uh, at the school. And then, this is a very poor man online discussion of online dynamics, but all the things that I discuss here actually uh, were first, I mean the fact that the equator actually will trap if uh, entropically uh, the system was a little bit discussed in the paper in, of Ross et al. And then there are actually two papers, and one is very recent, of these three. So Benarus, Gessari, and the Jagannath. So this is a math paper. So there are two actually on this topic, one from 2029, and one was actually 6, uh, 2022, so very recent, in which you can find, so they do, I mean, it's much more. They do also the discussion for tensor PCA. So if you want to, to look at the things done properly and done so rigorously, you can look at, the, uh, at this. It's just a particular case of what they did. And they study in, the, in general, so this uh, online dynamics, and, and they look at, uh, well, what are the questions that you get? And, well, there is one treatment of this, if you want to look more. Are there questions on this? Okay, so if there are no questions, I actually will, um, I will just show you a few slides and then I will conclude. What happens if ah. G doesn't fluctuate? Sorry? What happens if you don't sample G? Well, if you don't sample J, then you're back to the case in which you have uh, a lot of, uh, uh, so it's the case that we consider, it's the tensor PCA in which we, uh, that we consider, in which you have a very rough landscape. So maybe something that I can say that I didn't. So here you could say, okay, did I, I mean, it's, there is all this, this idea in which uh, SGD uh, or can help you navigate a landscape because it changes uh, it change the landscape at this time. So in this case, you could ask, uh, okay, what is the value? So here it's not able to escape, but what is the value of R such that you, I mean, it's, uh, you will be able to escape and to reach the signal? You see, because here you have uh, a, a competition between this, uh, this term here and this term here. So if you increase R enough, at the, uh, we will destroy this barrier at a certain point. So well, what is the value of R? Uh, so there is a very simple argument to see. And again, it's just a simple argument. If you want to, do, to see something more rigorous, you can go in this paper. So you, what you have here is what you want to do is that no matter what, here you will always start quadratically. So there will always be a small barrier. But what you would like to have is to, is to reduce this in such a way that the potential it's something like this, with a small barrier. And typically, this small barrier, it's at a value of m, which is here, which is much less than 1 of the square root of n. So if you are able to do this, then the typical initial condition will arrive here, so after the barrier, and so it will go down. And then so you can, I mean, it's, you can just see balance these two terms to see when this is going to happen. And then so if you balance these two terms, you have t, m, which should be of order of r, well, 1 minus m squared, but m is very small. So it's m to the p minus 1. And then this m goes away. And so what you want to find, so since this is of order 1, you want to find an r such that when you take m of order square root of n to the p minus 2, well, this actually is much larger than this term, which then it gives you that r should be, uh, well, much larger than n to the p minus 2 divided by 2 which means that you didn't, you didn't gain anything, actually, because this is exactly the same request that you have when you do gradient, uh, gradient flow and you don't change J. Okay, so at least in this case, yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't gain uh, anything. So you recover also in this case what you had that R should be larger than this value. Then what I miss, I also have to say that there are algorithms that uh, uh, they do much better than this, but it's not gradient descent or gradient flow. Uh, but this was just to show you that, yes, there is an entropic barrier. If you want to increase R to destroy this entropic barrier, or more to push it in such a way that typically the initial condition is above the barrier, then you get the same scaling. Other questions? OK, so then I, I will just uh, finish with a few slides.
Okay, so. There was a question? No, no. Ah. Okay, while we wait. Uh, so in my, in my lectures, I mean, the, my idea was to show you different techniques uh, in which you can study dynamics in high dimensional non-convex landscape, because this is something that is very difficult to, uh, to tackle. As I show you, it's not that there, there is a general understanding. There is just, I mean, some understanding in some cases, and then we try to go forward. Uh, and now I will just do a very big jump, uh, but this is really more to conclude, than just more to say that we don't understand really what, what happens in, in DNN, and certainly what I say to you does not apply, uh, even though you can, say some, you can see something. So what about real DNN? So imagine that uh, you try to see whether the things uh, I'm telling you uh, works in real DNN. Uh, so this is actually a work that we did uh, some years ago. It's just phenomenological or just empirical. And so it's just uh, like you would do in physics when you do an experiment. So well, you just look at different. So we have a certain phenomenology that I discussed to you. So in the regimes in which you don't find the signal, the system has some aging dynamics. And then at a certain point, we'll find the signal. What, we, what, you, what, what this kind of dynamics do you find in, in uh, real DNNs? And so what I will track is the uh, loss as a function of time. You remember, I show you that when you don't find the signal, this goes down in a, certain, in a power law way to some, to, some, uh, to some value. And then I look at the correlation function to see whether the correlation function so, shows some kind of aging dynamics, which means that the system is really uh, trapped in some part of the uh, energy landscape or loss landscape that has nothing to do uh, with, uh, with the signal. So just to remind you, so again, in the simple model that I discussed to you, this is what you find in the regime in which you don't find the signal. So the energy goes down, uh, actually goes down in a power law way. And then you have this kind of behavior in which you have the depending on the time at which you look at the system, then the, the, the system, it takes longer and longer time actually to... Uh, to equilibrate, which is what we call aging. So what you can do is that you can try to do, you can look at the dynamics of uh, neural network to see if you, you find something like this or not, and depending and in which regime. So what we did is to, well, to use the uh, usual data in images and then take different models. So there was, I mean, there are simple ones, uh, less simple ones, so one with a very big uh, hidden layer, three small layer, and a small net, net and rest net. And then, while well, we, in this case, so we have two regimes. I put what, quote, and quote, because first at that time, I'm not sure that at least for us was uh, all these things that we were discussing at, the, at this uh, summer school about interpolation threshold over parameterization wasn't so clear to us. Let's say that there are two regimes. There is one regime, which is the regime in which you use the number of parameters that are used in practice. So for example, for ResNet. And uh, in this, I will call it overparameterized, but I mean, it's overparameterized in the sense that at least for this one and for, for that one, you, you find that the, uh, um, where is the, the, uh, the, the, the train loss goes to zero. Uh, you find it here. So this is well, what you find in this system. So this is also to, uh, so here you have train loss, test loss, train accuracy, and test accuracy. So at that time, what we, and this is something that has been discussed by uh, several people also, is that you can find different regimes in the dynamics for when you look at the dynamics of this. You have a first regime in which more or less really nothing happens. Then there is a regime in which the system start to go down in lost landscape. And then there is a regime in which you start to have overfitting, even though this, the uh, test accuracy is still, uh, um, is still improving. And then, while well, there is, a, I mean, a really a third regime in which, well, the train loss is, uh, while well, there is another regime in which the train loss is zero. I mean, this is, we just divide in this way in three regimes, but probably, I mean, there is even four regimes, okay? So just, uh, just to show you what you see, and I'm sure you, you all know, because uh, there are many papers on the behavior in the dynamics. Uh, and then, well, this is the case in which, they say, it would be quote-unquote overparameterized. And now, if you take instead a small system, which is not able to learn, uh, so which is learned in a very poor way, so this is the kind of curve that you get. Uh, so I just, it's just the one example. It's just to show you that it's very different from what I showed you before. Uh, it's a very different behavior. 
And now what I'm going to look is the behavior of the correlation function, how the correlation function behaves. And so if, in the case in which is this, the network is over-parameterized, so in which, the case in which it learns, so what we find is that, so now it's important to understand what I mean. So this is the delta, is what in physics we call the mean square displacement. It's really how much the configuration has moved from a time tw plus t from the configuration it has at time tw. And this is a, fu is a, function, of, is a function of t. <laughs> the different colors here correspond to different times. And roughly speaking, this correspond to this dif three this, the three different phases. So this one, this one in which really it's a Google down, and this one in which you have zero trading loss. And now it's important to divide by d. So what is this d? Uh, so if you have just Brownian motion, uh, and you have Brownian motion on the plane, for example, this mean square displacement will go linearly with the temperature. Actually, it will go linear with the temperature times the strength of the noise. And now what happens here is that we divided by d, and d is the uh, uh, is the uh, is related to the is the strength of the fluctuation of the gradient, because the fact is that the more you I mean the more you go down in the loss landscape, uh, the more actually you are uh, you have classified correctly this example. So actually the fluctuation, what you could call the noise, is actually going down. So this is uh, something which uh, you really have to take into account. Otherwise, uh, well, you don't understand what's going on. But also, it's important. So it's, if you think in terms of noise, actually, the strength of the noise is going down during, during the dynamics. And so we wanted to see whether we find something which resembles to uh, diffusion. And so, well, again, so these three colors, what you see, you really seems to have really so a first regime of the dynamics in which you have this curve, which I don't know how really to interpret, this, this violet curve. Then you have an evolution, which is really when the systems start to go, uh, to go down the loss landscape. And then in the third uh, regime, in which you have uh, uh, the loss is, is very small, what you see here is that you find some, a curve which all the curves super, superimpose. So it seems that the system is in a stationary state. It's not really stationary because the, uh, this coefficient is changing. But it looks, I mean, that once you rescale with respect to the noise, which is going down, the system behaves in the same way. So it's a little bit. And all this is, of course, very vague. It's, it's a little bit like if the dynamics, so there are three regimes. And at long times, you have some kind of diffusion. But with the diffusion coefficient, which becomes become smaller and smaller. OK, so this is what we, what we see. And, uh, and then, while well, you could ask, uh, well, so first, the first thing that you sh sh should see is that this is clearly very different from recovering a signal that I discussed until now. So this is just, uh, well, to. Uh, even I'm sure that you, you, you have this in mind. But clearly, uh, what I discussed until now, which have one signal, and you have a rough part which compete with it, is very different to what you see in DNN. And, uh, but in DNN, you still have this, I mean, I think these three or four regimes, which are quite, re uh, you can reproduce if you do different experiments. And you have this interesting uh, final uh, regime. And then if you do, uh, instead, if you underparameterize, and here, here again, it's underparameterized, quote, unquote. It's not, I'm not meaning that we are below the interpolation threshold. So first, at that time, we, we didn't know about the interpolation threshold, at least us. And we just take, if you decrease the number of neurons and we go in a regime in which the system is not learning, then what you see in this curve, this is the, uh, again, is the uh, mean square displacement as a function of time. You find this curve, which are characteristic of, of the aging behavior. So what we, we find here is that, indeed, if the system is small, you have a dynamics in a very, let's say, high dimensional non-convex landscape, and the system is showing out of equilibrium aging dynamics. And then for bigger system, the one that works, it's very different from this. Now, this is what we found uh, at, the, at that time. I have to say that, I mean, understand, putting all the pieces together, so understanding, I mean, in a, at least in a simple model, which is not linear, which is uh, complex enough to show, uh, in, in, let's say, interesting uh, slow dynamics, and in which you have, for example, these three phases that I discussed, that would be great, but this, we are not there. Understanding how this transition between over-parameterized, under-parameterized, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think it ha has anything to do with the interpolation threshold, but understanding, I mean, having a phase diamond in which you have first this transition, then the interpolation threshold, and then discussing uh, also having these uh, three regimes of the dynamics, I think it would be great. But uh, I think it's something that in which we can work, uh, but uh, we are not there uh, at the moment. 
so I will conclude saying that uh, the dynamics of deep nets, so I think it's a very interesting and challenging open problem. So I think, well, you have seen that there are many things that have been understood, uh, uh, even mathematically, about deep nets. I think if you look at the, the empirical facts that are known on the dynamics, well, many are very shaky in the sense that they are not so well known. They change if you look at the literature every three months. But then there are some that objectively are, uh, are quite solid. And uh, I don't think uh, there are models that can really uh, understand all of them. And it would be nice. Uh, and I think, uh, well, my idea was to give you some techniques to, uh, to try to do this. So I think you have a lot of great questions uh, to answer. And with this, I stop. Do you have questions? So I'm still around until tomorrow. So if you have questions, you can you can you can catch me, and we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you.